Good evening. We're learning Masachis Yevamo Staf Ayin Bays. We're starting 10 lines down at the two dots. Yesterday, we had ended our conversation um, about this northern wind. And in fact, the Gemara had concluded yesterday that really it shouldn't be that way. Really, if a bris doesn't have a northern wind, if it's Yom Eva or Yom Shusa, the bris should be pushed off. But at this point, because Anashim were dush in these particular mitzvahs, the Gemara concluded, Shomer Psaim Hashem. So let's start this next little section with a short agarata that speaks about the uh, northern wind. Tana Rabbanon, Kolosan Arbaim Shan Shah Yisrael Bamidbar, Lo Haya Yom, Shalom Nishbabo Ruchs von Isbachat Sialayla. There was never a day in the 40 years that there wasn't a northern wind at midnight. And we know about this northern wind at midnight. Shinemar Vahibachat Sialayla, Vahashem Hikako Bechor Vichule. My Talmud, what does this come to teach us? Hakamashmalan de Ace Ratzon Milsehi. That this particular time is considered an ace ratzon. The middle of the night is a, is a time of uh, ratzon. Rashi, eight lines down, dear Mashal, ace ratzon milsehi. What's going on here? The cave in the chatzos alayla, ace ratzon habayla makas. Bechoros, since at chatzos alayla, all of the firstborns were killed at this time, which was an ace ratzon. Havay nami ace ratzon, the rachzfonis. It's also the right time for the rachzfonis. Ve'en l'chayom shi rachzfonis enim menashebas bo bachatzi halayla. There is no night when that wind does not blow. Okay, that's the agarata. The Gemara now presents a statement by Rafuna that will be questioned until the end of the page. The Gemara says, Amar Rafuna Davar Torah Mashuch Ochil Betruma. Midivrem Gazar Labim Nation Nirakara. A mashuch is a person who regrets having had a bris, and he does these manipulations to take whatever skin is left over and pull it in such a way where it begins to cover the atara yet again, to look like an aura. It says the Gemara, Min HaTorah, he's allowed to eat truma, but Midivrehem, because he looks like an aura, we don't allow him to eat truma. This would pose some uh, some other questions. Sometimes when, pa- when, when babies are particularly overweight, it looks like they're arelim, even though they've been circumcised, just the way things are laid out. It's, it's, they don't require another bris. How would that play out over here? Are they considered a moshech? Okay. Says the Gemara, let's question the statement of Rav Huna. Rav Huna says, Mido Raisa, all is well, but Mido Rabbanan, they can't eat truma. Says the Gemara, Mesve, one third of the way down on Ayin Beis Medal. Mashuch Tzarech Shehimo. We see that a Mashuch does need to do uh, a bris, and says the Gemara, it implies from here that this is talking about a Din Do Raisa. Says the Gemara, uh, nope, it's not Do Raisa, really, Mido Rabbanan, and really Rav Huna is right. And the person who thought that it was Do Raisa, the Karila, my Karila, the person who asked the question from the Brisa that says, Mashuch Tzarech Shehimo, why did he think that it was Del Raisa? So the Gemara responds with a little bit of a, wa- a long-winded answer. Um, and the Gemara says, after all, it seems to be that there's only Tzarech. Why? Tzarech was the reason we thought it was Del Raisa. Take a look at Rashi that clarifies this question for us. Rashi is just to the right of where we are. When it says Tzarech, without saying that he's an Arel, that implies that it's only Midrabanan. So again, the Gemara wants to know, what was the person thinking when he asked the question about Mashuch Tzarech Shehimo? When he saw the language of Tzarech and he did not see the language of that this person's an RL, he should have assumed it's Derabanan. Why did he assume it's Doraisa? Says the Gemara, Katoi B'Seifa. He made an error with the rest of the Brisa. And in regards to the Mashuch, Rabbi Yehuda argues on the Tanakama. The Tanakama... The Tanakama was of the opinion that he needs to do another bris. And Rabbi Huda says, no, lo yimo sakonahilo. You're not allowed because it's dangerous. And we were concerned that maybe there would be an error in the, the, the second circumcision and one might remove part of the Atara, which would be dangerous. Amrulo, they said back to Rabbi Huda, that's not a good argument. ben kuziva. Many people were circumcised in the days of ben kuziva. And they still had many children afterwards. You can't say that the argument argument by a mashuch is that the reason he can't get another circumcision is out of danger. After all, it should still be the case that they're required. And not only that, the Gemara brings a second proof to this, Omer as well, the to say that this person uh, who has um, uh, who has not followed my bris, who's rejected the bris, that includes a person who's Mosheikh, a person who pulls the orla forward in order to cover himself. So says the Gemara, my Omer, why did we need two rejections to Rabbi Yehuda? The first one being Himol Yimol, and the second one being Esbri Sihei Fer. Says the Gemara, halfway down a nine bays and the reason why we needed both of these um, both of these psukim is as follows. Maybe one would have argued that when it says that you should cut multiple times, that that's referring to not to talk about someone who's a mashuk, someone who's pulling their, their skin forward to cover the crown. If you would have thought that, and therefore we see that there are psukim that are discussing mashuk. So what was the mistake of the person who asked the question of Rufuna? Because 
says in the dialogue of the Gemara between Rabbi Yehuda and the Tanakama and the Chachamim, we see there that they quoted Psukim to prove their point. So therefore, it seems like the Psukim are referring to Mashach, and therefore maybe Mashach is Doraisa, Kamash Walan, that it's not, it's only Drabar. A little bit more than halfway down, the Gemara poses another question against Rav Huna, Mesve. The Brisa writes, Tum tum ein ochel betruma. A person who has uh, undefined genders, there's skin covering the anatomy such that it's not clear visibly as to what type of person this is. They're not allowed to eat truma. The Mepharshim here explained because he's an Aral. If he's a man, he's an Aral. If he's a woman, he's a woman. If he's a man, he's an Aral. Nashav, seemingly this word translates as his wife or his women, va'avad of ochlin that they're still allowed to eat. Mashuch v'nolar k'shehumol, a man who is a mashuch, who did pull, and this is obviously where the question is going to come in, harei'ilu ochlim. Rav Huna said that they can't be ochlim, there's a de rabbanon, that they have to do another bris. However, here the b'risa seems not that way. We'll come back to this in a moment. The b'risa continues, and drogan is a person who shows both anatomy is ochlim, v'truma v'ein ochlim v'kachim. They're allowed to eat truma, but not kachim. Tum tum eino ochel lo v'truma v'lo v'kachim. It mentions tum tum again. In the beginning of the b'risa, it says tum tum eino ochel v'truma. And here it says tum tum eino ochel lo v'truma v'lo v'kachim. Seems repetitive, and we'll get back to that later. However, for our purposes, we're asking a question on Rahuna. Katani mihas, what did we see here in this b'risa? Mashuch v'nolad. This, this actually re rejects the sheets of Rav Huna. Rav Huna was of the opinion that even though Midor Raisa, it's true that a mashach is allowed to eat truma, but Midor Rabbanon, where it goes around him that he needs another bris, or that he's not allowed to eat the truma like this because he looks like an RL. However, this Raisa seems to say very clearly that this person, that if he's a mashach, he can eat. Says the Gemara, let's analyze some of uh, this b'risa that we just learned. Amar Mar, we had said, tum tum ochel v'truma, nasha v'avad of ochlen. Now, there's a very big practical problem here. How can a tumtum -tum get married? It says that the tumtum -tum has a wife. What is the tumtum -tum that he's getting married? It says the Gemara, Nasha v'avada of Ochlin. That's what the Brisa says. Nasha v'tum -tum but how, how does he get married? How do we know that he's a he? Maybe he's a she. It says the Gemara, if you want to say that there was an engagement, a betrothal that took place, there is a b'risa that writes that if a tumtum does kiddushin, they're married, Niskadesh, and if he gets proposed to, kiddushav kiddushin. He's a double gendered or, or zero gendered, or whatever the modern terms, I don't know. What? We don't know. It's covered up. Right? right. We don't know. So technically speaking, if somebody walked, if he walked up to a woman and said, Haret Mikudeshasli, the Tabasukadas Moshe Bishal, he's engaged. And if a man walks up to the Tumtum and says, Haret Mikudeshasli, he's engaged in both cases. An unbelievable Messias. Says the Gemara. Wait one second. Even though that price is true, but Niskadesh Kudushavishan, that's true. Amor to Amar, the Khumra, that's. That's only the Chumrah. That's just to, to say that you might be in a, in a bind because if you have a child now, the child might be a mamzer. That's true. But still, it doesn't matter because Lakula, me, Amrina, we would never say Lakula that Stam, you're allowed to get married. Of course not. Suffolk Isha, he ain't Isha, Mikadesh is Isha. We don't know what your gender is. It could be the, that you're, you're what? Yeah. You're what? Nothing. Gemara <laughs> Mephoreshes. Yeah. 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 I oh, made Moscow. Yeah, we don't need any political interventions. It's a straight line. So the Gemara says, because the tum tum might actually be an Isha, so therefore he can't propose to another woman. That's not Kiddush. Okay. Only Lechumra, only when we have to factor in that maybe it was actually a man. But we don't allow them to get engaged the Chadchila. After all, ain't Isha Mikadesh is Isha. So Amar Abaye, no, this case of tum tum in the Brisa was different. What was unique about this case in the Brisa? It's true we couldn't see the Ever Hatashmish itself. However, Kshabetsav Nikaros Mi However, it was clear that this was a male. Not because there was an Aver Tashmish, however, there were there were there were baits in, there were testicles, so we knew that it was a male, we just couldn't find the kid itself. But Rava argues, Rava Amar, no. This is a regular case of tum tum. It's not a case of base of nikaros. Rather, we're talking about a regular case of tum tum. And my nasha, what does it mean when it says his women? It doesn't mean his wife. Emo is talking about his mother. That his mother is not going to be restricted from truma. Says the Gemara, emo pshita. Of course, the mother can still eat. Why would the mother not be able to eat? Says the Gemara, it's not so simple. molid machil. Maybe only if she bears a child who can bear children. Then she can eat truma, but she ain't molded, ain't no machil. But if she bears a child that can't be molded, such as this tum tum, then maybe she cannot be ochel truma kamashvala. So they both have viable approaches in the bray. So Abaye taking the approach that really here we're talking about someone with that base of our nikaros, that's why he can get engaged. We know what he is. He still needs surgery, but we know we know what gender he is. 
um, and therefore uh, he holds the way he does. And Rav is of the opinion that no, this Mishnah is not talking about Beit of Nikar, it's talking only about a regular Tuntun. So now let's analyze something uh, that's unique about this brisa. And I highlighted this before, that if you look back at the brisa that starts a little bit more than halfway down at the word mesve, it says in the first line that tumtum eno ochel betruma. Then a few lines later, it says tumtum eno ochel lo betruma velo bekacha. So we have two of the same exact cases, almost the same cases referenced. It says the Gemara, last short line, anayin beiz maral of tashma. Tumtum eno ochel velo betruma velo bekacha. Why was that line repeated? Bishlama le abaye, I could understand abaye. Abaye in the first part of the brisa, what did he say? The case was Beits of Nikaros. And then this case is a regular tumtum. That makes sense. Tana Resha Arel Vagai. The Katani Seifa Safik Arel. So therefore, I, we understand why both cases are listed. However, Ella Lirava, according to Rava, who says that the, the Bryce is not dealing with Beits of uh, Nikaros. There were, there were no testicles on this child, or at least not none visible. So then according to him, tumtum to seifa lamali, both cases are talking about a regular tumtum. There is no arel vada and so they're both regular tumtum and they're both suffix arel. So says the Gemara, if that's the case, why did he have both? So says the Gemara, no, my tumtum, one is talking about an arel. Says the Gemara, hashta suffix arel lo achil, vadai arel achil. But according to Rava, the flow of the Mishnah doesn't make sense because it seems to be that we spoke about an arel, that an arel is not allowed, and a suffix arel lo achil, vadai arel achil. Uh, rhetorically, we can't have it be the case that a suffix is not allowed to eat, and then you add in a new case of vadai. If the suffix is not allowed, for sure the RL, the RL is not allowed. Says the Gemara, you're right. How do we understand Rava within the Brisa, within the two phrases that seem very similar about a tumtum? Mm -hmm. Says the Gemara, the model of the of the Brisa is what we refer to as a matam. Ka'amar. What is the reason? Matam tumtum eno ochel betruma. Why is it? Quote the first line of the Brisa. Why is it that a tumtum cannot eat truma mibnei? Shesafik Aril, who the reason why is because of the last line of the Brisa, because this person's a Safik Aril. The Aril Eno Ocha Lobachuma Velobakache. Says the Gemara, maybe this whole discussion about Moshe Chesa Orla is actually a Machlokes Tana, and we did reject Rav Huna already. But now the Gemara is, is circling back and saying, maybe it's not so simple. Says the Gemara, Lena Ketanai. Maybe we should say there's a machlokes tanoim. Take a look at Rashi, two lines from the bottom. Name a kit tanoim, milsa de ravhuna, tanoihi, ihava mashuk de raiso de ravana. Maybe there really is a machlokes, to, a machlokes in the tanoim about mashuk being de raiso de ravana. That if a person does pull the skin forward with intention to cover the crown so that they don't look like a yid, they, 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 instead they look like an RL. So then maybe it's Daraisa, maybe it's de ravana. Let's see if that's a possibility. Afterward, after all, what does the Gemara say? Mashuk. A person who pulls the skin forward, the katan sha'avar zmano, ush arkol hani molen, that a case of a gershin iskayer uh, who was mahul when he did his conversion, a katan who passed the window of his eighth day, ush arkol hani molen, who are the other people who are going to be nimolen, says the Gemara, a person who has, has two foreskins. Before Shem explained that, I've never seen this, I don't think, I don't know if it's a thing, but. It said there's a regular foreskin, and then on the outside, there's yet another layer of foreskin. So it's, I guess, two full sets of foreskins. I don't know if that's a biological thing. I've never heard of it, seen it. I've only seen it in the Gemara. I don't know. But anyways, the, all of these cases, the halacha is they can only have bris mila during the day. We pass in this way, that the din is that if a baby has a bris late, it has to be during the day. This happened to me. I had a baby. I was supposed to do a bris for a baby, and the baby had an anatomical issue. And I said to the family, "Come, I'll take you to this urologist who I work with at his office." We brought him to the clinic. The doctor was running late. By the time we got the green light to do the circumcision, it was five minutes after shkia. So we're makbid gummer. We don't do any brises after shkia, and we did the bris the next day. It was a big headache because I, I could have done zero travel at that point, or then you have to go home and then a whole new trip. Doesn't matter. That's the din. The din is that the bris has to be done beyond. However, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Shimon, Omer, a little bit different. He says, Bismano, when the bris is on time, top of Ein Beis and Beis, then a nimolen el beyom. However, shelo bismano, maybe we would say nimolen beyom ubalayla. That's a big nafkamina. We don't do this, but it's a big nafkamina. According to this Chakira, it would seem that it's possible that a bris should be done even at night if the bris is shalob is mano. Now, remember that the core of what's happening here is about Moshe. It's not about little kids. It's about Moshe. So the Gemara seems to say that by Moshe, the bris can be done uh, only during the day. That's the sheets of the Tanakhama. And Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimon says that it can even be done at night if it's not on time. Says the Gemara, 
top of Ayin Beis and Beis, second line. My la b'hakamiflagei. Isn't this really the machlokas at hand here? Demar savar moshech de oraisa, and because moshech is de oraisa, therefore the bris can only take place during the day. Umar savar moshech de rabbanon, and really the second cheetah that says that it's bayomu valayla holds a moshech is de rabbanon. Says the Gemara, you can't say that because Mashach was coupled with the bris meal of a regular baby. The Tisbara, can you possibly say that it's derabanan? Katan shavar zmano miikal amanda amar derabanan. You have a child who missed their uh, the, the the ideal window for their bris. Day eight is over. So what? The, the bris is not deraisa. The Rambam and the Rabbit have a big machlokas. If there's a chiyuv kares every day or only, if, only upon one's death when there's no bris, of course there's a dindo raisa for bris mila. So this understanding of this machlokas between the Tanakama and Reb Shimon and Reb Lazar Reb Shimon is impossible. Therefore, says the Gemara, Ella de kule alma mashach derabonon. Everyone agrees that a person who has pulled forward, pulled forward whatever skin is left over in order to cover the crown, they agree that that's only a psul de Rabbanon. And with katan sha'avarzmano del raisa, and of course we agree that if a child has a delayed bris, the first adult circumcision I did for a Jew, he was a 35-year-old man. So we made a bride, and I wasn't the mole, but I was watching, and I watched the, the person who trained me do the bris. Brachas b'shem amalchus. It's a mitzvah de raisa like any other mitzvah de raisa. Late, but so what? It's a mitzvah de raisa nonetheless. It says the Gemara, what then is the machlokas here uh, between the shita of mashuch and not mashuch, whether, whether or not, like the Tanakama said, that we can do a bris shalobizmano at night, uh, or no, the Tanakama says the Brishlo is, al- is also during the day, and Reb uh, Lazar Reb Shimon holds that it's even at night. What is that machlokas about? Six, seven lines down. We darshan the letter Vav, which means it's even during the day, even if it's Shalob Ismano. And therefore, if a bris is Shalob Ismano, then it, it, it can even be at night. Says the Gemara, there's a similar story to this effect. Rav Yochanan was in the base Medrash and he was teaching something that he had learned in Abraisa. It was about Nosar. Nosar, Bismano, Eino Nisraf El Nosar, on the day which it becomes expired, the, the Srefa has to be during the day. Shalob Bismano, if the burning is at a delayed point, Nisraf, Bain Bayom, Bain Balayla. Very similar model that when we have a mitzvah that's no longer during the day, so then it, 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 that's no longer Bismano, so then we push, then we say that the Srefa can happen <laughs> even at night. The Eisvei Rebbe Lazar, the Rebbe Yochanan. Rebbe Lazar was a Talmud of Rebbe Yochanan. He was a third century Amora. Rebbe Yochanan was a second century, really a bridge to the first, but primarily second. So, and what did Rebbe Lazar say? I only know from the Psukim that when a baby is on his eighth day from birth, that the bris has to be during the day. How do I know that if a bris is pushed off just by a handful of days, that still we only do the bris during the day? Talmud Lomar U Vayom. So what do we see from him? We see that the Vav is, uh, is going to help us that when a bris is shalob is mano, that it's even during the day. But here was the push that he gives back to Rav Yochanan, who was speaking about Nosar. Even according to one who doesn't learn the Vav of Uvayom, Vav he darish. But when it comes to letters Vav and He, that's Veha Nosar. So he's pushing back against Rav Yochanan. Rav Yochanan was of the opinion that if you're burning Nosar Shalob it can even be at night. Rabbi Lazar gives a whole drasha and he says, no, when there's a Vav and a He, everyone agrees to that drasha and you should not be able to be so if Nosar Shalob unless it's during the day. So Rav Yochanan was silent. Ishtiki didn't say a word. Basar de Nafak, after Rabbi Lazar walked out, Hamar le Rabbi Lazar le Resh Lakish, he says to his Chavrusa Resh Lakish, Ra'isi le Ben Pedasha Yoshev Dorsh Kemboshe mi Pi Agvura, what a Balgaiva, sitting here darshaning things that he thinks is right. Rav Yochanan thought he was making it up and just cheppering him on his sheet about Nosar. So it says Resh Lakish, Hamar le Resh Lakish, Didehi, that's not his Torah, Masnisahi. That's actually frowned in the Tanoim. That's a source in the Tanoim. He didn't make that up. So, uh, Rav Yochanan is the Talmud Chacham, and he's a humble person. So he says, "Hey, well, I've never seen that brisa. Where did he see that brisa from? That the vav and the hey is a drasha that everybody makes in Beha Nosar, and therefore when Nosar Shalobizmano can only be nisraf during the day. So it says the Gemara, but Torah's Koranim, it's in the Medrash Torah's Koranim. So he says right away. Yochanan walks out. Nafak he goes out. Tanya betlasa yomi. He pounded Torah's Koranim for three days straight, and he learned all of it. And then he spent the next three months v'svara betlasa yarche. And then he spent three months just understanding the svaras of what were in the Mishnayas. That's pretty uh, approximately right about how we learn Gemara. It's a very, very heavy ratio of Mishnayas 
uh, of Gemara to Mishnayis. So what was the ratio he gave in days? It was three months is 90 days to three days of learning. So that's a one to 30 ratio. So for every Mishnah, there should be 30 times the, the volume of study, apparently, whatever that ratio is. In other words, Mishnahis are very cryptic. And we see that all the time. You see a Mishnah, we don't, when you first read the Mishnah, you're like, okay, it's a Mishnah. Then you read the Gemara, you're like, whoa, I, there's so much nuance in there. I didn't realize how exacting it was. So that's what Rabbi Yochanan is teaching us here. Fine. The Gemara says a third of the way down, a little bit more. Amar Rabbi Lazar, Arel Shehiza has Asuk Shera. Yesterday, we learned a din that an Arel can get Haza. Can he give Haza? Can he sprinkle someone with the mechatas? It says Rebbe Lazar that yes, an oral shehiza haza asuk sheira. No different than midi dehavi atvul yom. Shafal pisha asir betruma kasher bepara. He's still allowed to do the para. He's still allowed to do the haza. And the RL should be no different. It says the Gemara malat tvul yom shekain muter b'maiser. But there is something unique about a tvul yom that maybe makes it incomparable to the case of the oral shehiza, and that is that a tvul yom is allowed to eat maiser. It says the Gemara atu anu leachila kamrina. Nobody here is talking about eating any food. We're talking about an RL who's going to touch the mechatas on a linegia kamrina. And what's our argument? Um, just like a tvul yom was not allowed to touch the truma, is mutter to do the chatas, the mechatas of the para, then arel shem mutter benegi, and arel is not tame. An arel is allowed to touch these foods, eno din shem mutter bepara, all the more so he should be allowed. And in fact, the brisa supports this idea, tanya nami hachi, arel shehiz haza asok shera. It seems like a very clean cut sugya so far, that it seems like an arel is allowed to sprinkle the mechatas on a person who's tame mez. Says the Gemara, a little bit more than halfway down, Hang on one second. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't finish the brisa. Umaisa haya beachsher chachamim hazasa. A little anticlimactic. Sorry about that. The brisa reads that an RL did haza and it was kosher, and the chachamim actually had a story like this, and the chachamim allowed this uh, RL to do the haza. Mesa, the Gemara asks a question. Tum tum shakidesh. Let's say again, we have this person with undefined anatomies. We don't know if he's he or she is male or female, and they were kidesh. What does it mean to be kidesh? Rashi, fifteen lines from the bottom, approximately. The Ramaskal shakidesh. Sheirev efer b'mayim. He took the afer mechatas and put it in water. You can't just sprinkle the ashes. It has to be in the water. So the tumtum did that, shakidish. Kidusho puzzle. No good. He ruined the mechatas. Uh, talk about the most expensive ashes in the world. This is not exactly the kind of thing you want to mess around with. How many paradumas do we have? So says the Gemara, why? We don't allow the Kodesh. We don't allow this person who's a tumtum to mix the afer with the water because there's every chance that he's male. And if he's male but uncircumcised, then he's ineligible for doing this activity. Continues the Bryce of Androgynous Shekidesh Kidusho Kosher. That if you have an androgynous who has both anatomies, he's going to be kosher. Why? Because knowing that he has both anatomies, he's done a bris already. He's not going to leave him an RL. We don't know what gender he is, but at least he's not an RL. He's for sure circumcised. However, all of this is the sheet of the Tanakama. Yes, it's true. He may have an he may have an aver that requires a uh, that requires a bris, and he may have even done the bris as an androgynous, but he also might be female, and a female is not allowed to do this. So uh, that uh, brisa is now concluded. But the Gemara learns from here. Katani miha. What did we learn from here? Arel the suffix Arel pasul mila kadesh. And if that's true, then how did how could Rebbe Lazar be right? How could the brisa be right? We had said in, in Rebbe Lazar's statement in the brisa to match. We had said the halacha is that he's allowed to, the RL is allowed to do hazah, but that's not, doesn't seem to be the case from this brisa. So I'm Rav Yosef, don't worry. Hi, Tana, Tana Debe Rebbe Akiba. The Tana that, that we just learned, that seems to say that, a, <clears throat> that an RL is not allowed to be involved in Kodesh, that is a sheet of Rebbe Akiba. Because he does treat an RL like a tame. And therefore, we can't have the previously listed leniency of the Brisa, who obviously is someone other than Rebbe Akiva. The Tanya, Rebbe Akiva, Omer, Ishli, Saravas, Ara. Omer, Rava, Rava says, I don't understand. Rava was fourth century Amora in front of his Rebbe, Rebbe Yosef. Bekashali, Rava says to Rebbe Yosef, I don't understand this whole thing. If Rebbe Akiva is right, don't leave out his shita. What should you have said? It should have said, the brisa that we use, the Tanya Nami Hachi that we used about eight, nine, ten lines ago that says, Arel Shehiza. If Rebbe Akiva is right, it should have said, Arel Vatame, Belema, Rebbe Akiva, and say his name. Says the Gemara, we did, just not here. Below, we do say it. We learn this in another Masechta. 
in Chagiga that if a person is an Aurel or a Tame, they're potter from the mitzvah of Re'i, of going up to the base of Mikdash. Says the Gemara, that's not a Raya. When you see the words Aurel and Tame put together for Re'i, no, Hasam, it's not because an Aurel and a Tame are equals, but Mishum de Mice, because a person who's an Aurel, it's Mice, it's disgusting. They're not welcome in the base of Mikdash like that. But it's not because they're halachically the same. And this Machlokas of Rebbe Akiva and the Tanakama. The Rebbe Kiv and the other Brayse of Azdu Amaihu. This matches up to their shitas. How so? Says the Gemara as follows: It's not ten lines from the bottom. Ayin beis mid beis. The Mishnah writes: Hakol Kshirim Lekadesh. Everyone can do the mixtures of uh, afer and water for the mechatas. Chutz mecherashot bekatan, except for people who don't have das. Rebbe Huda Machshir bekatan. Rebbe Huda does allow for a katan, but Uvi Isha. But excludes women. Says the Gemara, my time at Dirabanan. Why is it that the Tanakama was of the opinion that everyone is kosher to be Makadesh except for Khershot Bakatan? Dhsib, the Lakhula Tame Meafar Srefa Sachatas, Hanach the Pasle Ba Asifa, Psulin Bikidush. Anyone who's not allowed to do the Asifa, the gathering of the ashes, then they're not, not allowed to do the mixing of the water with the ashes. But Hanach the Ksherim Basifa Ksherim Bikidush. But somebody who is kosher to do the Asifa, so then they are kosher for the Kidush. So that explains. Explains the sheet of the Tanakama. Rabbi Yehuda Amar Lach No Im Kain Neima Kra Vilakach. The pasuk has uh, the, its plurals and singulars messed up. The pasuk says Vilakhula Tame, and then later in the pasuk, the pasuk says Vinosan in the singular. So let's read the pasuk. Vilakhu plural they Vilakhula Tame Me Afar Sreifa Sachatos Vinosan, and he placed a love Mayim Chaim El Kelly. So the pasuk has its singulars and its plurals incorrect. It's inconsistent. So that's what bothers. The sheet of Rabbi Huda, and he says, "My, uh, my velakhu. Why is it plural?" Says the Gemara. Must be says Rabbi Huda. It must be that even those who might be possible for the asifa, but still, when it comes to the mixing, uh, in the, let me just say that again to be more clear. That even those who might not be allowed to gather the ashes, they're still allowed to do the mixing of the water with the ashes. Says the Gemara. Then why then does Rabbi Huda exclude a woman? That's different. Because there it was written in the male form, and he gave, and that excludes women. Because of Rahman of Alakhu Vinasnu, and had it been that it was that the Pasuk was consistent with its plurals and said Vilakhu and Vinasnu, so says the Gemara, how does the Tanakam explain this? How Bamina the Shakle Tre be Yabitre? There would have to be two people. Mm, I skipped a line, sorry. So three lines from the bottom. Virabanan, how do the how does the Tanakam explain this? Why is it that it says Vilakhu and Vinasan, one plural and one singular? So the rabbis explain, Ikasa Vilakh Vinasan, had it been consistent with the, the with the singulars, both singulars. That it has to be one person who uh, who takes the um, who takes the ashes, collects them, and one person who gives the ashes. Therefore, kasev rachman of alakhu to say that that's not true. The kasev rachman of alakhu v'nasnu had it been consistent in that both of them were plural. Habamina the shakli trevi yavitre. The two people have to do the process in the beginning and at the end, and that's not true. Kasev rachman of alakhu v'nasan afilu v'nasan. It says v'lakhu v'nasan the plural and then the singular. The afilu shakli tre v'yavichad. Even if the number of people that give one don't give the other, that's all fine and good. Two more lines. How do we understand that a tahor has to be maze unto the tame, that a tahor has to sprinkle the tame? Says the Gemara, a very unique drasha. Tahor, michalal shu tame. When it says vihizaha tahor, that a person who's tahor has to do the sprinkling, why didn't it just say nothing? This person should sprinkle. Oh, you're saying that he's tahor? He must be a unique kind of tahor. Tahor michalal shu tame. And that teaches us that a tvul yom is in fact kosher for, uh, for sprinkling the mechatas. We're going to stop right here. We can pick up tomorrow three lines down. I'm most likely going to be here tomorrow night. If that changes, I'll let you know uh, sometime earlier in the day. If that happens, we'll probably do Dafiomi Friday morning. Not so likely, but it is a possibility. I'll keep you posted. Wishing you all a beautiful night. Where are we going?